Well, this evening, our subject is particularly relevant to what's happening in today's world. And we've had a look at Joel chapter 3. It's an ancient prophecy, but it is very relevant because we've got two major events that are happening right now in the Middle East. There's another one that's going to start on Monday that, of course, is very relevant to the subject matter we have tonight and very relevant to some of the phraseology of Joel, Old Testament prophecy. So the exciting part about what current events are happening in today's world is it confirms for us the Bible record. And we've read many of these passages for years and years. Sometimes we may have even struggled with, well, what does this all mean? Many of these passages, passages now are very enlightening to us as we see current events unfold and we find relevance in these prophecies. And of course, as Brother Brian's men mentioned, we're looking at verse 9, particularly that's the centre point of this prophecy, that talks about the military strategies of nations being initiated and of course, rather than people uh, residing in comfort and safety and security, there'll come a time when the world is put on a knife edge, a tension point, because the big military machines will be initiated and we're seeing some of that happen today. And we're going to, have to talk about that. What is exciting about Bible prophecy is that, as we've said, it confirms the Bible and we've seen just in the last couple of years some amazing events happen, some very significant events. One, of course, we're familiar, of, familiar with is Mr Trump in America and, of course, that has uh, relevance to us because he has promoted himself, well, not promoted himself, but he has become really quite a random politician. People are a little bit apprehensive. They're scared. They're frightened as to what he's going to say next. So on the scene of international politics, of course, uh, he doesn't quite have the reputation that other political leaders have. And there's been, of course, a downward spiral of international trust as far as Mr Trump is concerned. The angels have put him into place for a very significant reason, and that is the withdrawal of America from international affairs, particularly in the Middle East and also in Europe. I read an article the other day that said Mr Trump will go down in history as the great uniter of Europe. Uh, and it's really a, an odd sort of phrase, but the reality is he's helped to reunite Europe again into the enfolding arms of Russia because Europe no longer trusts America. He said that he doesn't uh, really think they should finance NATO, which they've done for years which was a protective umbrella for the European nations against Russia. Now that's all being dismantled. Europe, of course, is coming more online with Russia's policies. And, of course, we know that's part of the proof of the Bible. So we're seeing a united Europe. Uh, as well as that, one of these little statements here in verse 9 says, let the, or verse 10, let the weak say, I'm strong. And we've, again, seen the reality of that with well, what's called Mr. Rocket Man. We all know, little Rocket Man. Mr. Trump, of course, made some obscure comments about this little man comes from a little country who thought he was very powerful on the world scene and challenged Russia. So again, when we read that verse, we can see the relevance in today's world. Israel just this year is celebrating a generation of existence, 70 years. And again, we're reminded of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke 21. He said there'll be people alive who will see that generation point. And that's us ourselves. We've seen Israel in the land for 70 years. That's a significant point when it comes to Luke 21. The other thing that we have seen, which has been an amazing shift, is Russia in the Middle East as a force. You know, 10, 20, 30 years ago, we would be having to prove to people that Russia even has an interest in the Middle East. We don't have to do that anymore. Because, of course, here's the area that is promised to the people of Israel, the promise to Abraham, which will be fulfilled when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Israel is this area here. Russia has already centred itself in Syria. It has both airfields and naval areas that has given reinforcement to its position in the Middle East. That's significant because Daniel chapter 11 says at the time of the end, Russia would be in that position. We thought the Lord would already have returned and we would see none of this. So the long suffering of God has waited. The proof is visible, it's evident to us, it's unquestionable, and it's an exciting thing. The other thing we're seeing, which we've sort of mentioned, is Europe's shift towards Russia. So what's happening is there's a new uh, gas pipe stream being built under, under sea, straight into Germany. 
straight in here. It's called Nord Stream 2. It's going to open next year, 2019. This is going to feed 70% of Germans, German requirements for energy. So you can see there's a very strong connection between Germany and Russia, as we would expect. Ezekiel chapter 38 talks about that. Go to the land of Mago. Mr. Trump had this little comment to say. He said, Germany is totally controlled by Russia. Well, that's pretty astounding. There's been a, a massive shift. Germany is totally controlled by Russia. They'll be getting 60 to 70% of their energy from Russia. And you tell me if you think that's appropriate, because I think it's not. I think it's a very bad thing for NATO, and I don't think it should have happened. Well, it's going to happen because the Bible decreed that Germany and Russia would be united. We're seeing this as evidence before our very eyes. So as we say, there are a couple of big events that are happening right now, this week and in a couple of days. The one event which you may have heard of is Vostok 2018. It's going to start on September 11, so a couple of days from here. It's going to be a massive military exercise that Russia is going to determine uh, that will occur from Siberia through the Bering Sea. Massive. And, of course, some of the news headlines are highlighting what is the reason for this huge military exercise. So is this a rehearsal for global war? We're talking 300,000 soldiers. 300,000 soldiers being involved in this exercise. Absolutely massive. So ABC says Russia is rehearsing for a global war and giving early warning to the West. Uh, this isn't the Bible you're reading. These are today's headlines. We've already read the Bible. It says the armies of the world will be awakened and drawn to the Middle East. NATO sees Russia, Vostok 2018 drills as preparation for conflict. Russia to stage the biggest military exercise since the Cold War. 300,000 troops, 1,000 aircraft, 900 tanks. There's one goal. So, you see, the newspapers of today are reprinting what Joel said 2,500 years ago. Prepare war, wake up the mighty men. And that's starting to happen before our very eyes. So, as we say, it's the largest contingency of ships in the Mediterranean for some time. And that's one step closer to the massive event, which we know will come to pass, that has been decreed in God's word, when all nations will be drawn to Jerusalem. The angels, really, are working this sign to encourage us and to show us everything's under control. It's all going to happen according to God's timeline. So the last time a big event, military event like this happened, as far as Russia was concerned, was back in 1981. It was called Zarpad 81. It only involved 100,000 troops. We might think that's big numbers. But compared to the exercise that's happening in two days, it's only a third of the size. So this is absolutely massive. Back in 1981, the world conditions were very different. Uh, Russia was going to invade Western Europe. That was the thought at that particular time. The Soviet Union just invaded Afghanistan. It was 1981. President Reagan, if you remember back to those times, had just assumed office. So there was a fair bit of tension between Russia and America, and of course this exercise happened. Well, it all really sort of fell apart because Mr Gorbachev came along and practised perestroika openness, and of course the Berlin Wall came down. Russia lost its control of Europe. So what's changed now in 2018? Is Russia uh, in the position, of course, to exercise this? Well, from, a, from an economic viewpoint, no, not at all. They're actually struggling economically because the, the value of life, the expense of everyday living, is costing another 20% to the average Russian person. There have been sanctions by America and other nations that have, again, put pressure on Russia but it's about to do the largest military exercise it's ever done in its history. So many of the military strategists are questioning why would Russia involve itself right now today in such a huge military exercise. The other thing that a couple of commentators have made note of is it hides the shift of military transport. When you have a massive movement, of the military, you can shift stuff around without people knowing. And they've suggested, and they've, this has come up on social media, that some of the military armaments of Russia is headed to the west instead of the east, being sent to the area of the Ukraine, 
Remember, Mr. Uh, Putin has been very interested in that area of Ukraine. They're saying a lot of this stuff is heading across to the east instead of the west, and some of it possibly down into Syria as well, back down into the Middle East. So Mr. Putin is very smart. He's, he's got these exercises going on, perhaps to camouflage other movements of military hardware. So why is this all happening? Well, what the strategists tell us is this. Russia's got sanctions, it's struggling economically, but it's holding the largest military engagement in its history. And it says, they say, the Vostok 2018 military exercise is a part of a broader information campaign to increase the worldview of Russia as a dominant military power. So on the world scene, what Mr Putin is trying to accomplish is a message to the rest of the world that Russia is a world player when it comes to dominance. Now, that might be surprising to many people in today's world, but to Bible students, it's not surprising at all. We know that's always been the case. And we want to unpack Joel chapter 3, a prophecy that's 2,500 years old, to show that the prophecy of Joel is as fresh it's as fresh as the media reports you read today and you will read in a couple of days when this military exercise is launched. So let's have a look at Joel chapter 3. Just to unpack this and see how relevant God's word is to today's world. A lot of people think, well, the Bible's an ancient history book. It's got some moral teaching and that's about it. Well, no, it actually gives us a hope for the future as well. Despite all these military exercises that are going on, all the political backstabbing that's happening, the Bible gives us some hope. So what's the first couple of words in Joel chapter 3? Well, it says, behold, for behold. So what Joel is saying is he wants to arrest our attention. This word behold means stop and have a think about it. it doesn't just, the narrative doesn't just flow on. It says, behold, stop, look. I'm going to give you something, some information that is urgent. I'm going to outline some of the events that are going to happen that are going to unroll that precede the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's really a continuing narrative. If you look back up a couple of verses into chapter 2, you notice that verse 32 is talking about salvation and deliverance that will emanate from Zion and Jerusalem. It talks about that. It talks about people being delivered and that there will be a remnant that will be saved. And Joel now is going to say, well, how is that going to happen? He says, behold, I'm going to give you that information. And the narrative rolls all the way through to chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. This is the final, this is the bottom line of Joel's prophecy. In verse 20 and 21 of chapter 3, he says, Judah will dwell forever and Jerusalem from generation to generation. God will dwell in Zion. That's the bottom line. That's the end of the story. That's the final picture. So Joel is going to take us through the steps that will bring us through to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the establishment of safety and security in Jerusalem and in Israel. Well, he says that Jerusalem is going to be a place of safety and security and permanency. It says there in verse 20, it will dwell forever in Jerusalem from generation to generation. That's telling us that Jerusalem is going to be a place of permanency. So when we look on the international scene, there's a lot of tension, a lot of turmoil about the city of Jerusalem. Is it going to be divided up into an international city? What's going to happen? Well, this is the final outcome, says Joel. And, of course, it's a process, Joel says, that is currently taking place in preparation for the great day of the return of Jesus Christ. So here's a little theme that's right through Joel. This is what he's focusing on. He's focusing on the great and terrible day of God when his judgments will be unleashed and when Jesus will return to repair this earth. And so right through Joel you've got this little phrase, the day of the Lord is at hand. Again, it's worth colouring in. You know, if you've got nothing in Joel, he's a minor prophet, I guess. But this is a, a consistent theme right through Joel. Alas for the day, the day of Yahweh it is, is at hand. Chapter 2, verse 1, the day of Yahweh cometh. Chapter 2, verse 11, the day of Yahweh is great. Chapter 2, verse 31, the great and terrible day of Yahweh and verse 14, multitudes in the valley of decision, the day of Yahweh is near. So this whole theme of Joel is the return of Jesus Christ and the resolution of world problems. So it's a positive message. So that's why he says, behold. 
And Joel's going to get very specific. Did you notice in verse 1, it says, in those days and at that time. So Joel's narrative doesn't just roll on, says, behold, you know, these are the events that's going to happen. He says, I'm going to give you a timeline, a time marker. He repeats himself. He says, in those days and in that time, and he even wants to get more precise, when, when I will bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. We might say some of that phraseology is superfluous. But Joel is very specific. He says, I want to give you a time marker for when these events are going to happen and what will be the final outcome. So, well, what's the time marker, Joel? Joel says, when God will bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Well, this little phrase, bring again, doesn't mean they're going to go back into captivity. In actual fact, it means I will reverse the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. The ESV says, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. So what this verse is saying is the time marker for the processing of this prophecy will begin when Judah and Jerusalem come back to their original land, when they return back, time marker. Or I might say, well, who's Judah? And he also says, and Jerusalem. So there's two distinct phases to the return. Now, those of us, of course, who know um, Bible prophecy and history would be aware of this. So when he talks about the returning of Judah, who's Judah? Well, it's the land of Israel. So here are some quotes that talk about the land of Judah. It's the land of Israel, just if we're unsure. So here back in Deuteronomy 34, it's when Moses went up and had a look across from Mount Nebo, across the land, it says, he saw all the land, Naphtali, Ephraim, Manasseh, all the land of Judah. So he's looking down on the land of Israel. So Joel is talking about the return of the Jews. Here it is again in 2 Kings and here in Nehemiah chapter 5. So the land of Judah is the people of Israel. And, and Joel says the trigger point will be, the starting point of this prophecy will be when Israel come back, the people of Israel come back. Well, of course, history has shown that that occurred in 1949. 48-49. Uh, after 2,000 years, the Jewish people returned back to their own land. This is the first time since this particular prophecy. It's absolute proof. We, it, it's unquestionable. And here's the little comment here. I will reverse the captivity. Joel 3 verse 1. State of Israel was born and as we know, it was fulfilled in 1948. Now, Joel is not the only one who says that. Here are other prophets who talk about it. So we're not just uh, cherry picking a little chapter out saying, well, look, this, this chapter proves this will happen. It's consistent with all the major prophets. Now, Joel might be a minor prophet in some sense because he's only got three chapters. But here are the major prophets. Ezekiel 36 says, I'll bring you into your own land. I'll take you from all those nations. Jeremiah 16 says exactly the same. So here are these prophets dovetailing the trigger point that will start to unravel the process for the lead up to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he says, the return of Judah, and now Joel wants to make another point, and, and, critical word, and Jerusalem as well. So there's two separate phases, 1948 and 1967. So again, here, of Judah and Jerusalem. Well, the Jewish people didn't have Jerusalem in 1948 when they came back. So that's amazing that this detail could be re recorded by Joel. That occurred in 1967, and the Lord makes reference to it in, in Luke chapter 21. So you see how specific Joel is getting with this, this whole process. And the next point is, he says, I'm going to return. The people of Israel are going to come back. Jerusalem is going to be freed. Verse 2, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. So the next movement is going to be nations centering themselves in the Middle East. We've seen a start to that. We're seeing Russia now coming to the Middle East. A few years ago, you remember Mr Putin said, job done. We came into Syria. We've done a job. We're pulling out our troops. Well, hello, that hasn't happened because there's now a permanent interest in the Middle East. And it's going to get bigger. 
So verse 2 says, I'm going to gather all nations to Jerusalem. So what we're seeing now with this massive troop movement in a couple of days, 300,000 soldiers, is nothing compared to what we will see as this prophecy unravels. And again, Joel isn't the only one that says that. I'll gather all nations. Zephaniah says, my determination is to gather the nations and assemble the kingdoms to pour on my indignation, my anger. Zechariah 12, verse 2 and 3. Zechariah 14, verse 2. All this talks about a great centre point in the Middle East of military-minded nations seeking world domination. Well, that's the message we saw some of the military um, analysts look at this exercise as far as Russia was concerned, world domination. So this is, this is absolute proof that every piece of the jigsaw is falling into place. So Joel says, I'm going to gather all nations. And so some of the major nations are now quite uh, tense about what's happening. A little place called Idlib. I'm going to play a video clip in a moment that will give you a bit of background on what's going on there. Essentially, this is the last stronghold for the terrorist organisations. Syria wants to get rid of them. Russia wants to get rid of them. Turkey's not quite sure because Turkey is taking on board and has taken three million refugees. If this tends to be a, another a bloodthirsty battle, there will be another three million refugees fleeing into Turkey. So Turkey's very apprehensive. And Mr Putin has said, well, sorry, uh, it's going to happen. So, you know, Tur Russia is taking control in this particular situation. But there's a whole lot of players there. Even America is bringing in now uh, carriers uh, and defence systems in case chemical weapons are used again and they're going to launch more missiles. So, you know, this, there's a trigger point here in the Middle East that a lot of people are very apprehensive about. Well, God says he's, got, he's going to bring those nations and we're seeing that happen. Well, where's he going to bring these nations? He says into the, into the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Valley of Jehoshaphat. Hmm. Where would the Valley of Jehoshaphat be? Well, obviously, and those of us that know geography, it's right outside of Jerusalem. It's on the eastern side of Jerusalem. Here's the Valley of Jehoshaphat. There's one of the old walls, and this is the area here. It says that in verse 2, verse 12, and also verse 14. So Joel is very specific where this is all going to unravel. It's the Valley of Jehoshaphat, and there's a little picture there. Again, you know, this isn't just cherry-picking one verse. Revelation 16, New Testament now, a bridge across the New Testament, links exactly the same thought process. Uh, John in Revelation says, I'm going to bring all the kings of the earth and the whole world, same as Joel, to gather them to the great battle of the great day of God Almighty into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, well, Armageddon. Well, wait a minute. John in Revelation says Armageddon. Joel says the valley of Jehoshaphat. You know, is this a different place or who is right? So let's just analyse exactly what is going on here. Well, in Revelation, it specifically says the Hebrew word is Armageddon. So it's not Greek, it's Hebrew. So when we break down the Hebrew word, interestingly, it means a heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. So here's the picture. The nations are like a heap of sheaves. God's going to bring them in for judgment. It's the whole threshing process. Well, of course, when we analyse the name of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, it is Yahweh will judge. And you'll notice in verse 14, it's described there not so much as the valley of Jehoshaphat, but see verse 14, the day of Yahweh's near in the valley of decision. If you look at your margin, you'll notice the word threshing there. So these all co-join together. It's a pretty clear explanation. Revelation is not different than Joel. They're talking about the same thing, nations being brought down to Jerusalem and God's going to thresh them. There's going to be a judgment process, which will, of course, be the starting point of the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom. So it's in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. The prophecy goes on and he says, and the reason God's going to do that is going to, at the end of verse 2, he's going to plead there for his people and his heritage and his land. And again, those three little phrases are worth colouring in. Because, you know, there's a lot of international concern about Jerusalem, who owns it. You know, should embassies be moved to Jerusalem? It should be an international city. Uh, it, it's the centre point for Christianity, for Muslims, for Jews. Who, who, who does it belong to? Well, very simply, uh, Joel here says it's God's people, it's God's heritage, and it's God's land. 
and he's going to have the final say to it. This, this is the whole process. This is the resolution of all that tension. God's going to take control of that land and it's going to become the nucleus of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, interestingly in verse 3, Joel goes on to say one of the things that, that has upset God is that they've cast lot for my people and, they've, well, the end of verse 2, they've parted my land. Uh, Joel says they have parted my land. Now, what's interesting about that statement is we know, again, we've seen it uh, in the last century that the land of Israel has been divided or parted. Back in uh, 1922, 1920, um, this was the British mandate and this was the land that was to be given for the return of the Jews. You know, the Balfour Declaration went out, homeland for the Jewish people. And this was generally uh, the British mandate and this was going to be the land for the Jews to return to. Look at that. It's you know not, not a bad area at all. Well, that's not how it worked out because the land was mandated. The United Nations, of course, uh, gave a vote for the partitioning, the parting of the land of Israel. So Joel's prophecy is alive in a most remarkable way. Look at the parting of the land. Here we've got sort of Arab areas and here are Jewish areas. These were designed because the borders are indefensible. You might think, well, that's, why is it such a mess? Well, it was deliberately parted that way so that neither side could really defend themselves appropriately. And, of course, in recent times we've seen these walls go up uh, if you needed a visible sign of the parting of the land of Israel, well, here it is here. These walls have gone up, of course, to protect the people of Israel from the West Bank particularly. But there's the visible evidence of Joel's prophecy, they've parted my land, absolutely seen uh, in, its, in clear evidence today. And not only that, of course, this year, America has shifted its embassy to Jerusalem. Well, there's a furor over that. I mean, the shifting of the embassy to Jerusalem was... Uh, a determination of Mr. Trump, and it was a political win for the people of Israel. They've always striven for that undivided, eternal capital is Jerusalem. But of course, everybody else wants to divide it up, exactly as Joel says, they want to part my land. Well, Joel, go Joel goes on in verse 4, and he says, What have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and the coast of Palestine? <coughs> Well, back in the, the times of Joel, of course, these were the neighbours of Israel, Tyre, Sidon, Philistia, Edom, and they cooperated with the Assyrians to round up the Jewish people and send them off captive. So God was really saying, what have we in common? There's nothing in common. Of course, those areas are particularly interesting because Tyre and Sidon is modern-day Lebanon. Palestine, well, that's Gaza. We've got Hezbollah and Hamas in those areas, that today are agitating against Israel. So not only is the land of Israel parted, verse 4 talks about these areas of Lebanon and Gaza agitating against the Jewish people. So again, this was taken in May this year. Uh, Joel's fresh prophecy is coming to fulfilment in a most remarkable way. So, of course, there's a lot of anti-Semitism about the people of Israel and we see that today. Well, of course, this will eventually lead to a major conflict. And verse 9, which is the highlight of our, our, our point tonight, is that there will, become, there will come a call to war. So verse 9 says, Proclaim this among the nations, prepare war, and wake up the mighty men. Now, you know, notice on the word prepare, if you've got a King James margin, says Hebrew sanctify. So there'll be religious overtones to this whole conflagration that will happen in the Middle East. And again, this isn't just some cherry picking of a verse. The New Testament is exactly the same. Paul writes in Thessalonians about the same situation. He says, nations will get comfortable, they get secure in a lot of the diplomacy that's going on. The United Nations have all these meetings and we'll, we'll talk about things and we'll, we'll try and solve things. And so people will step back and say, well, the world's a pretty safe place. Well, Joel says there's going to be war. People are going to be woken up. And Paul says in Thessalonians that he says there'll be a time of safety and security, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night 
When they say there is peace and no danger, sudden destruction will come upon them. So again, Joel dovetails so amazingly uh, connectedly to the, the statement of the Apostle Paul. Well, what's going to happen? Well, there's going to be a military conflagration in the Middle East. We're seeing the beginning of that now. I'm going to play you a clip relating to uh, what's happening right now as we speak. So there's no complacency now in Syria. There's a lot of tension that's rising on the part of Turkey, of Iran, of Russia and America. So just have a, a listen to this clip. Millions of Syrians are facing possible bloodshed in Idlib province as the Assad regime prepares to recapture the last major rebel stronghold. Russian President Vladimir Putin, Iranian President Hassan Rouhani, and Turkey's Recep Erdogan are holding a crucial summit on Syria today. They're meeting in Tehran to discuss the war and looming battle in Idlib. Rouhani says America's intervention in Syria should immediately end. U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Nikki Haley issued a stern warning for Syria and and its allies. And the Russian Federation has recently been building up its naval forces off the coast of Syria, signaling that Moscow is pre-positioning itself to once more abet the murder and mayhem of the Assad regime. And as has happened numerous times in the past, there are signs that the Assad regime is planning to use chemical weapons to finish off the siege of Idlib. Well, for more on this, I want to bring in uh, CBSN contributor Willis Sparks. He writes for Signal, a newsletter produced by G Zero Media. So, Willis, we have this summit happening uh, right now, actually, but we also sort of have an idea of what is of interest to the, the power players here. Uh, Iranian President Hassan Rouhani said earlier, the fires of war and bloodshed in Syria are reaching their end. He wants America to pull out. We're hearing now that Turkey suggested a ceasefire, which was opposed by Russia. Give us a sense of, you know, what these countries want and how important this summit is. We have to take a step back first. Syria has been in civil war for seven years. Half a million people have been killed. Twelve million Syrians have been driven from their homes. We are now on the verge of the last major battle of that civil war. It's very clear that President Assad in Syria is going to win. This is the last battle, and there is a very serious risk that this is going to be the bloodiest fight of the entire war. Because what's happened is, as Syria has gained back territory, all of the people who have been pushed out of the places where they've been fighting in the past have all ended up in this place called Idlib province, which is in the northwest of the country, very near Turkey's border. This is the last stand of rebels, terrorists, and there are three million civilians, men, women, and children, who are caught in the line of fire. So what we have today is a meeting that you refer to in your question in Tehran between the president of Turkey, Recep Erdogan, President Vladimir Putin, and Hassan Rouhani, president of Iran, where they're trying to see, is there a way that we can avoid the bloodshed, that we can engineer a surrender of the rebels so that we don't have to go you know, fully into this place mm -hmm. with three million people caught in the crossfire. The problem with this is, of course, Turkey wants a ceasefire because Turkey doesn't want a huge battle in this place that is going to drive hundreds of thousands more refugees across the border into Turkey. Right. Turkey is already home to three million Syrian refugees. They don't want any more refugees. That's their main concern here is let's not have a battle that pushes a whole another wave, in this case maybe a tidal wave of people over the border into Turkey. Iran and Russia are allies of Syria's Bashar al-Assad. They want this over. And while the UN is saying, look, there's three million people caught in the crossfire, let's create a humanitarian corridor to allow those people to escape so they're not in harm's way, the Russians and the Iranians are saying, if you let the innocent people out, the terrorists are going to go with them. It's time to finish the war. So there's a lot of pressure from Russia and Iran and Syria to just go in there and level this place. Now, the role that the U.S. is playing, the Trump administration is doing what any U.S. administration would do.
which is to say to Assad, you have used chemical weapons in the past. You know it and we know it. You better not do that again. If you do, you're going to pay a price for it and you won't know what that price is until you've already crossed the line. This has been going on for years. President Obama had to deal with it. President Trump is dealing with it right now. The UN is saying it is credible that the Syrians are going to use chemical weapons here. The whole world is going to be watching for that for reasons that go well beyond Syria. But what's at stake here really beyond the humanitarian crisis of three million people caught in the crossfire of what may be an absolute conflagration is the risk that you're going to have another tidal wave of refugees. The Europeans are watching that. We've got an election this weekend in Sweden. Italy's politics is totally defined by immigration politics right now. Germany is obviously very concerned about this. We're seeing this play out across Europe, and Turkey is at the front line, again, because they are housing so many refugees. Everyone is watching little Idlib province and what's going to happen there this weekend, and there is a real concern that it is going to be an awful battle. So, you know, there's some complexity to this whole situation, and it's not just a localised battle, as he said, the commentator said, this will have repercussions into Europe. So if there's three million refugees, another three million, there's another layer of refugees, a tidal wave going into Europe. So the battle is bigger than what we may imagine. But of course, nations are focused on it. There's a lot of tension there. We'll have to see what the outcome is going to be. But this is exactly as Joel says in verse 9. The other thing he says in verse 10 is interesting as well. He talks about nations beating their plowshares into swords. Now, you know what's interesting about that verse is the very reverse of Isaiah chapter 2. We're probably familiar with Isaiah chapter 2, where it says, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pretty hooks. This is in New York. Of course, you can go to New York, and there's a wall there that says the nations are going to beat, beat all their military implements into implements of agriculture. Well, of course, Joel reverses all that because that's the focus of the nations. They want to resolve something, there's a lot of tension, and so they'll do it from a military aspect. Well, what's going to happen? Well, verse 11 says, Assemble yourselves, come all you nations, gather yourselves together round about, and then in brackets, Joel says, Thither cause your mighty ones to come down, O Lord. So, What's interesting is Joel puts a little bit of his personal narrative in there. Because in verse 9, 10, 11, there's actually three forces involved in the process of this prophecy. The three forces are, in verse 9, there's the phrase, the mighty men. These are the, the, the big military giants of today's world. Then, of course, in verse 10, it talks about the weak who are saying they're strong. So we've got Kim Jong-un. You know, with all his nuclear armaments, who knows what's going to happen? That wasn't really resolved. So we've got the weak as well, who's saying they're strong. They want to have an input into us as well. And then in verse 11, it's God's mighty ones, the angels, perhaps the saints as well, who are involved in the whole resolution of this prophecy. So there are three elements there in verse 9, 10, and 11. Well, of course, the nations in verse 12, as we've said, uh, come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And we've already commented about, uh, commented about that. And the result of that, as they're all gathered together, verse 14 talks about that. Verse 16 says, God will roar out of Zion, utter his voice from Jerusalem, the heavens and the earth shall shake. So again, multitudes in the valley of decision, margin says threshing. There's a couple of good quotes you can put uh, against uh, verse 14 which correspond with other prophecies. Um, Daniel 2 verse 35 talks about the empire image of Nebuchadnezzar standing up and it's going to be smashed and he says it's going to be like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. So that phraseology beautifully dovetails into Joel. Joel says the nations are going to be there, they're going to be threshed. Daniel adds in they're going to blow away like chaff. And Micah chapter 4 uh, says exactly the same. They want to destroy Jerusalem. Uh, the record says they don't realise they've been gathered together to be punished in the same way that grain is brought to be threshed. So again, the phraseology of Joel corresponds to other great prophets like Daniel and Micah as well. Well, of course, what happens in verse 16 is there's a great earthquake. That's what it says there. The heavens and the earth shall shake. Again, 
corresponds to other prophecies that we know will occur. Ezekiel 38 talks about a massive global earthquake that will happen at that time. Zechariah 14 talks about the Mount of Olives split in two. So the beautiful thing about the prophecy of, Zer of Joel, which you know we maybe we haven't opened and considered it because it's so small, is that it corresponds with all these other major prophecies that we would be familiar with. And of course, the New Testament, Revelation 16, is a very applicable chapter on Armageddon, and it talks about a great earthquake. So that's what's going to happen. The nation's going to be gathered. There's going to be a lot of tension. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to return. There's going to be an earthquake that will shake the very foundations of this earth, and society will need to be recalibrated. They're going to have to think about life in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we might think that Joel chapter 3 is a very gloomy chapter that's all about violence and, and, and military conflagration. Not at all. Because here's how Joel finishes his prophecy off. This is the end process. And this is the wonderful outcome of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 16, at the end of verse 16 it says, But the Lord will be the hope of his people, and the strength of the children of Israel. Again, if you've got a margin on that word hope, look at the margin, place of repair. So God's going to repair Jerusalem. He's going to repair Israel. He's going to repair the Jewish people. He's going to repair the world. So there's a, a beautiful end process to this prophecy. There's going to be restrictions in verse 17. He says, strangers aren't going to take control of Jerusalem. That's been the history of Jerusalem for the last... Thousands of years, 2,000 years. Empires have tramped over Jerusalem. God said, well, that's going to stop. It's going to be the centre point of Christ's kingdom. There's going to be refreshment. So this will talk about moral refreshment emanating from Jerusalem. It says there a fountain will come forth from the house of the Lord. So there's going to be an international house of prayer and administration in Jerusalem. And those teachings will be distilled out to everybody. So it's going to be refreshing. We're going to see some proper leadership, not so unbalanced as some of the political leaders today, but a benevolent, knowledgeable leader who has the reputation to give proper advice. There will be reinforcement, as we've said, of proper principles. There will be the reconstruction of the nation of Israel and there will be the restitution, of course, of God's principles and values because the final verse says in verse 21, 21 that God will dwell in Zion in the presence, of course, of his son. So Joel has this beautiful balancing principle. Yes, nations will come down. There will be frustration. There will be annoyance because they can't solve all these political problems. But the final end is that Jesus Christ will return to this earth and there will be peace, there will be security, and God's presence will be felt in this world. That will be a wonderful thing. So really... Joel chapter 3 is, is an interesting summary of what Armageddon is all about. You know, when we hear churches and people say this word Armageddon, or maybe we've seen movies on Armageddon, we all get worried and frightened that the earth's going to blow up into smithereens and that's going to be the end of it. Not at all. God has guaranteed this is a positive end process to all of the frustrations of humanity. This is the wonderful promise of the Bible. This is the worldview of the Bible. And for you, if you're struggling and trying to think, where's all this going to go? Where's society headed? This is some wonderful and comforting news. So Joel really gives us a, a summary of the when, where, why and what of Armageddon. He says when. When is it going to happen? Well, one of the trigger timelines is when the Jewish people return. Well, we've seen that. So the process is now unravelling. Jesus will be here very soon. Where will it happen? Well, we've talked about that in Jerusalem. Why will it happen? Well, because God's people are scattered. He's going to bring them all back and they're going to be part of God's kingdom upon the earth. Who's going to be involved? Well, it's not just Israel. It's going to be all nations. It's going to be global. And finally, what will be the outcome? God will dwell in Zion. So we've talked this evening about the nations waking up militarily to try and resolve situations. And that certainly will occur. But there's a personal invitation for us. Maybe we've got to wake up. Maybe we've got to see the relevance of the Bible in today's world. Maybe we've got to lift up our heads and rejoice because although there's a lot of tension and dismay and disturbance in people's lives, we don't have to have that in ours because we've got the wonderful hope that Jesus Christ is going to return to this earth and God's presence will be seen in this earth again. That's the wonderful hope of the Bible, friends, brothers and sisters. Let's make sure that we find relevance in the Bible for ourselves 
and in our own lives.